Um, I'm going to get ready to share something with you. And, and last week we spoke on the importance of the resurrection. And I'm going to be in that same trend of the resurrection and, and continue to talk about a few thoughts and ideas around the resurrection of Jesus and what that, what that looked like. And just, we, we will go there now. Just, just this is an extension of, of that message as well. But Luke... Luke chapter 24, I'm going to be reading from verse 13. Luke chapter 24, verse 13 to 35. This is a story of Jesus sneaking up on two disciples after his resurrection. And we're going to watch this moment play out. And we're going to hear from both the disciples one of them was his name was Cleopas and there was another person with him unnamed could have been his wife could have been a friend could have been a brother there's no real details around who who was with Cleopas but Jesus he sneaks up on them and he has a conversation with him and I want us to zoom into that conversation and then from there we'll we'll take this message somewhere now that same day Two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. This is talking about the death of Jesus, the crucifixion, just everything that just went down, and about Jesus' life and who he was and what, what, what was his purpose here, and just everything about Jesus. The Bible says, as they, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. Verse 17, he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. So these men were... There was a sadness in their heart, perhaps even a bit of, bit of broken hearts. And, and we know that was the state because we see that consistency even with many of the other disciples. There was the sadness, this brokenness, there was this emotional pain they had as well about everything that took place. And Jesus is walking with them and the Bible says they're walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, seven miles Seven miles is about 11 kilometers. If you're walking for 11 kilometers, you'll, you can walk about two and a half hours. About two and a half hours walk. This is a two and a half hours walk that Jesus is journeying with these two disciples from Jerusalem to Emmaus. So you can imagine, there's a lot going, there's a lot to say in two and a half hours. I mean, there's some people who can share their whole lives in five minutes. So imagine, imagine what is being said in two and a half hours. And we will see what, what, what they going, what, what's going down here in this Luke chapter 24, verse 13 to 35. Verse 18, the Bible says that one of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there? In the, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. <laughs> this is Jesus talking to them about himself, asking things about his own self. He's like, tell me. Tell me about myself, man. What things, he asked. And they said, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priest and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said. 
but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe. This is Jesus replying to them now. After they said all this stuff, um, that he was crucified, they went to the tomb, he wasn't there. We hope that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Jesus walking with them and he says, how foolish you are and how slow to believe that all, how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So here Jesus himself goes to the scriptures. He goes to the Old Testament and he explains to them what Moses said, what the prophets said. This is Jesus himself now referencing the word and he's showing them this is what Moses said in the perhaps in the in the Torah in the five in the Pentateuch the five books of the Bible and then what what the prophets said and we understand the prophets said a lot about about um, Jesus in in several messianic prophecies and so here we have here we have we have Jesus revealing himself to them through the scriptures. Verse 28. And the Bible says, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going further, farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. In verse 30, the Bible says, when he sat at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and he gave it to them. And the Bible says, then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while, we talked, while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. Then they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, the Bible says, it is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two who told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them, then the two who had happened, who had this happen to them on the way, and how Jesus, and they said how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. What a story, man. What an encounter with Jesus himself. This is one of the more clearest encounters of Jesus. And Jesus revealing himself to, to disciples without telling them who he is. We know this also happened in, in, at the tomb um, where Jesus, the Bible said that, he was talking to the woman and they thought he was a gardener. So Jesus was so in that resurrected body, he was so he was so common and so usual. I mean, he looked like someone who was just working in, in the garden around the tomb. But there's the resurrected son of God. It tells us a lot about how Jesus operates, how he functions. This morning for a few moments, I want to give you a title of, to, to my message and, and be just build. I want to build somewhere. I feel like I know where I'm going. I've got a few things going, but we, we want to go somewhere this morning. But this morning for a few moments, I want to speak to you from the title, From Broken to Burning. From Broken Hearts to Burning Hearts. When we think of the crucifixion of Jesus, as a 21st century church, we see the crucifixion of Jesus in its totality. Today we stand as a 21st century church and we understand more than what the first century church understood. Today we have the entire Bible. By the third century the Bible was a symbol and we have today the gift of of the closed canon we have the canon of scriptures and we have the old testament the new testament presented to us as a as the bible the first century church did not have the privilege 
of the Bible. In fact, the disciples at this point in time, there was no Bible. There was no written scrolls, nothing. No one had even written at this point in time, at this point in time about, about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and all the miracles he had performed. So as a 21st century church, we, we, we are exposed um, to the things of God, biblical literature, understanding the things of God, Jesus, God himself. We understand it with, um, with a, a greater assurance and conviction. Because since, since the burial and the resurrection of Jesus and the early church of the first century, there's been, there's been the Bible, there's been theology upon theology, there's been, there's been resource upon resource, book upon book, there's been preacher upon preacher, there's been church upon church today. There are millions of churches all across the nations of the earth, billions of Christians uh, that are all across the nations of the world, and they are there, and we, 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 we celebrate. Today, last week, we celebrated Good Friday, which is the, the burial of Jesus, and we celebrated Resurrection Sunday, the Easter weekend, celebrating this whole, this, whole, this whole powerful and supernatural event where Jesus was crucified and was raised from the dead. But we celebrated because we understand everything that took place. It was, it's real to us. We have a conviction and we have an assurance about, about, about everything that took place because we have the full story. We have the full picture. They don't have the proofs that we have today. They don't have the assurances that we have today. You can read from Matthew to, to John and you can see this entire gospel. They did not have the privilege of hearing and seeing all of these things. There are many proofs of the resurrection. I, last week I spoke to you about some of the minimum facts available about the resurrection. And through that you saw how powerful the resurrection and how real the resurrection is. Today I can give you more of those proofs. In fact, I want to show you today just to, to, build, my, to build my case and my argument of, of how much how much more privileged we are than, than the first century church in the sense of how much more we know today. That, at that point in time, there were, there were many things happening yeah, at the resurrection of Jesus. There are things that we know about the resurrection today that they did not know at once. We, when Jesus was resurrected, and I'll take this opportunity to, to just share a few more proofs of the resurrection and tie that into what I want to say today. We see that there are, there are several proofs of the resurrection. Last week I gave you a few. I gave you a, a few reliable facts. Um, and, and that was more speaking to the mind. And it was a bit may, maybe more academic in a sense that I needed you to think about the Bible. And just the facts of the Bible. Before we even, before we even just get into the faith of things. But today we, we, we see. We, we, when we look at the resurrection. I just want to show you five proofs very quickly. The first proof we see about the resurrection is that we understand that Jesus was placed into it when he was taken from the cross. He, he was then, he was wrapped up and he was, he was wrapped according to, you know, Jewish custom. He was wrapped up and, and he was taken and his body was placed into a tomb. He was placed into a tomb. A tomb was a big, a big rock structure and... It was, the tomb was at least about, not our common grave. Some of you are thinking of a tomb if you've not been in church ever. Or if this is your second or third time in church. Fourth. Or maybe you're in church all your life, you haven't been listening. A tomb. Today we think a tomb is just what we see in our graveyards. But this tomb was at least a few meters wide and it was quite big. People, more than one person could st stand inside of the tomb. And so Jesus' body was placed in there. And then to, to seal up that tomb, that tomb was closed a stone was rolled to close up the tomb anyone ever been to israel here anyone no one yet israel tour next year june 16th to the 17th <laughs> so we the tomb was then rolled the stone was was rolled in front of the tomb but one of the proofs that jesus was truly resurrected the first proof I want to give you is that the seal of the tomb was broken. That's the first proof. The seal of the tomb was broken. Put on Matthew 27, Matthew 27, 62 to 66. I'm going to move through this very quickly because this is just 
part of me building my thoughts here. And I just really, I, I, I never, I, I always tend to, when I, when I preach on, on the resurrection, on Resurrection Sunday, the next week we just change the subject very quickly. And I felt like I was just meditating on so many things about the resurrection. And I just want to share this with you. The next day, the one, the, the next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priest and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, talking about Jesus, that the deceiver, Jesus said, after three days, I will rise again. So this is the chief priest going to Pilate and saying, hey, Pilate, hey, bro, this man, this, this deceiver, he said that he's going to rise again from the dead. And then in verse 64, the Bible says, they said that, so give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Because he gave this, he was giving out this claims that he's going to be raised from the dead. And we heard something about the third day. We don't know. He said a lot of crazy stuff. <laughs> and otherwise, the Bible says, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. And the last deception will be worse than the first. Saying Jesus coming and doing all those miracles and all the signs, that was already a deception. If they're going to steal the body and say that he was raised from the dead, this deception is going to be worse than the first. Like this case is going to, in other words, it's going to be out of our control. This is going to be wild. And he said, take a guard, Pilate answered, go make the tomb as secure as you know. And he said, so they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone. And they posted a guard there by the, by the tomb. So they sealed it. Now, I went to go look at what the seal looked like. And there's one or two, not just like, there's actually just one or two ideas around what that, what that seal looked like. It was just a, it was kind of like a, like a piece of rope that would, that would be sealed with a type of clay. And then there would be some type of rope that would attach it that stone to the sides so that seal first had to be broken in order for that thing to be opened so we see that that seal was broken that is one of the proofs is that the seal was broken and it it the the seal was was broken I'm going to go to the next point and we're going to tie this here. The second thing we see here is that the stone was moved. The stone was moved. Let's go to Mark 16 verse 3 to 4 quick. Mark 16 verse 3 to 4. The Bible says, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away? from the entrance of the tomb. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. So we see that the, the, the tomb was, was, the stone had been rolled away. So yes, the seal was broken. The tomb was rolled away. And, and the third point was we see that the tomb was empty. And we know that through Luke 24, 1 to 3, well, the woman went to the tomb and they saw that the tomb was empty. There was no one in the tomb. The fourth, the fourth proof of this resurrection is that Jesus was Jesus' grave clothes. The grave clothes of Jesus was still on the inside of the tomb. And it was still in his exact same place as it was when Jesus' body was there. There was also a napkin on the side that was well folded and it was placed right next to the tomb. I mean, right next to the grave clothes. So obviously Jesus, when he was resurrected, took that, like Jesus, he flashed out of the body. The grave clothes were still there and no one unwrapped him. We see when they called Lazarus out of the tomb, Jesus then said, unwrap the grave clothes from Lazarus. So we see Jesus wasn't unwrapped because the, 
the, the grave clothes were still in its place, like there was a body on the inside. And then the, the napkin that was around his head was well folded and it was placed on the side. Now there are some rumors, some people say that the napkin, the way it was folded, represented a certain, um, certain Jewish custom. There's no real proof of that, there's just stories that came out. But some people say that, you know, when, when they sat at the table and there was a servant, um, the napkin would be folded and um, the servant would not, could not touch that napkin you know, until the master maybe got up, went to, went to do something, came back. Um, he could not touch that napkin until the master came back. And so it was a longer Jewish custom, which I don't really want to explain this morning, but they're saying there was a, a custom attached to it, and that napkin, the way it was folded, was basically telling people, and this was really his servants that would follow him, that I'm coming back. I folded this and I've left this here, in the tomb, I'm coming back. And it was a message that he was sending. And so we see his grave clothes were intact. It was, it was all still the same. And, and that napkin was well folded and left on the, on the side. And then the fifth, the fifth proof is that the soldiers, they ran away. And we see that in, in Matthew 28, 2 to 4. Matthew 28, 2 to 4. The Bible said there was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. And verse 3, his appearance was like lightning and his clothes were as white as snow. And the Bible said the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. So you always see that these guards actually saw the angels that came these gods saw the gods saw and we know it was not just these gods but more than one god that 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 ran back to the to the roman government to tell them hey this is just what went down now and we see that in matthew 28 verse um 11 to 15 let's read that very quickly i just want to show you this quickly while the women were on the way some of the gods went into the city and reported to the chief priest, this was first to the, the leaders, and reported to the chief priest everything that had happened. Verse 12, when the chief priest had met with the elders, the Bible says they devised a plan and they gave the soldiers a large sum of money. Verse 13, telling them, you are to, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while you were still asleep. And if this report, the Bible says, get to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the disciples took the money and did as they were instructed. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated, the Bible says, among the Jews to this very day. And so these, there were soldiers who had this, who saw this angels come. There's one proof. And we know that they, this chief priest was so convinced. They knew that how, how stuck are you in your religion that an angel of your God came to visit the soldiers, came to visit the tomb, brought an earthquake, resurrected Jesus. How stuck are you in your ways and your religion that you would, you would tell the soldiers that you sent to guard the tomb to tell a lie by giving them money. They were polluted with their religion to a point where they could not even, they could not even recognize that Jesus was truly the Messiah. There were, there were too many proofs that Jesus was resurrected. Now we know all this stuff today. We know this. But those disciples at that point in time did not know all these things that were happening at this point in time. These disciples were not in the position and the privileged position that we are today to know all of the stuff that were happening. These disciples were, we today have the assurance, we have the conviction, we know that, that Christ has been risen from the dead. Not only do we have the facts, but we have you are the facts. We are the proof. The church is still alive and well today. And it's all because of the resurrection power of God. 
that is still alive and burning within the church all across the world. How many of you are thankful for the resurrection power of God? You've got to give Him praise for that. So, so there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of, there were, there were many things happening in that time. The, 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 there were many things happening. There were, there, there was a lots of, there were lots of um, speculations and assumptions and, and about who Jesus was. Even the disciples, they, they, they were, they were journeying with Jesus for three years, but there was a growing understanding that this man is the Messiah. Because as they moved with him, from the time they called, they were called, as they journeyed with him, they realized, yo, this guy is really the Messiah. This is the man who's come to redeem us. There were too many claims among the religious leaders, among the disciples himself, among the, the wider crowd. This is truly the Messiah. Remember the time when Jesus came to his disciples and he said, he says, who does men say that I am? And he said, some say you Elijah. Some say you John the Baptist. Others say you are one of the prophets. Then Jesus looked at them and said, but who do you say that I am? Because we, there were lots of conversation. Some were saying he's a prophet. Some were saying, no, he's the son of God. Some were saying, no, he's the Messiah. Some were saying, I wonder who would you have said Jesus is when you were alive that day? I think he's John the Baptist, man. Yeah, he's Elijah. Came back. He came back as Elijah. Jesus, but who do you say that I am? And Peter whew, says, Thou art the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal to this. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. But my Father, which is in heaven. And he says to Peter, it's, it's, it's by divine revelation that you have understood this. Now you know. You know that you know now. You've seen the proofs. But my Father has even revealed this to you now. This is who I am. I am the Messiah. I am the Son of the living God. So they, they, they thought he was the Messiah and they thought he was, he was coming to redeem them. But their idea of redemption was very different to the way we understand redemption today. The redemption plan of God today. We see that Cleopas in, in, in Luke chapter 24 verse 21, he says, We hoped that he would come to, to redeem us as the people of Israel. Our hope was that he would come and he would redeem Israel. But what they misunderstood was, they misunderstood the way Jesus would redeem. Jesus did not come to redeem Israel by, 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 by restoring and by reversing the curse and reversing the oppression. Jesus had a bigger story of redemption that he was talking about. They thought he was coming to overthrow the Roman Empire and he was going to take over and he would then rule and they would reign with him. That was their idea of redemption in Israel. But Jesus came with a bigger plan of redemption. Jesus wasn't there to redeem the Jewish people. Jesus came to redeem both Jews and Gentiles. Jesus did not come to reverse the curse of the Jewish people. He came to reverse the curse of Adam. He was on a bigger assignment. He was busy with a bigger plan here. So, so they, 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 so you're wondering why am I saying all of this? It's important for me to say all this because if you can, if you can, if you can catch the picture of the day and understand that it's not so complete as it is with you today, you will understand many of the things I'm about to say now. So these people had, yes, they, we, we have today an assurance, we have a conviction. On the other hand, the, however, on the contrary, the, 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 the disciples, instead of conviction, they had confusion. They were unsure. What we know today is that Jesus was someone who gave up his life. But it did not look like Jesus was giving up his life at that point in time to the disciples. It looked like he was murdered for claiming that he's the Messiah. 
just tell your neighbor, it's okay, you can, it's okay, this, this morning's gonna be okay, just tell them it's okay. <laughs> so they thought he was being murdered. They thought he was being, his life was being taken, but we know today his life wasn't being taken. He gave his life away. He offered his life as a sacrifice. So in light of all the, in light of, of the crucifixion and in light of Jesus in light of Jesus going through everything you went through at that time today it's a time of joy for us to celebrate that event death the burial the resurrection but for the disciples it wasn't a joy if there's one thing that was happening in the disciples at that point in time it was confusion it was, they weren't sure. They were distressed, they were overwhelmed, they were anxious. They were heartbroken. The disciples were heartbroken. We know that they were heart, we know that Peter was heartbroken because Peter, after the, after the death of Jesus, the Bible said Peter was so, Peter was so, he was so broken that Jesus, the Bible says so powerfully in the book of Mark is that he, he told the other disciples, he said, you know what, I'm going fishing. The very thing that Jesus called him out of, Peter was now returning to fishing. He goes, to, he goes fishing and the Bible says he, he's fishing and we know that Jesus appeared to him on the beach and he calls, he, uh, how do you like Jesus, man? I'm telling you, Jesus. Yeah, I know he's a real gangster. Young. Look, he's on the beach, eh? And he's cooking a meal. He's brying fish. Maybe he was busy with a nice snook. Now we know there's no snook, but you know what I mean. He was, he was frying fish. He's brying fish, and, and Peter's, Peter's on the sea. And the Bible says he's busy brying. He doesn't, he doesn't call Peter, nothing. He goes on. He's, he's, he's busy with the coals. He sets up the coals in the fire, and he's on the beach. And, and, and Peter's busy in the sea. You know, he's busy catching fish. And the scripture says that Peter looks at the beach and he realizes, hey, that is Jesus. And he jumps out of the boat. Can you imagine? That's, do, do we have any movies like that? I'm always talking about those movies. I'm always looking for a scene I can perhaps, you know, kind of. But, but he jumps out of the boat and can you imagine him running to Jesus? And he, says, and he runs to Jesus and he holds Jesus and Jesus begins to talk to him. And he, that's when he says to him, Peter, Simon, Peter, you know. He says, will you feed my lambs? And he says, Lord, you know I will. And Jesus, will you feed my lambs? He says, no, I will. And Jesus asked him like three times. And the fourth time, Jesus said, Peter, will you feed my lambs? He said, Lord, you know I will. And the Bible said he got offended. Oh, will you serve me? He said, sorry, oh, I'm, I'm quoting the scripture wrong here. Will you serve me? Will you serve me? Will you serve me? And then Peter was offended. And then the Lord said, okay, now go feed my lambs. Yeah. <laughs> Pastor, just quick error there. Go feed my lambs. And we see that, 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 that Peter was a disappointed man. He was broken. He was burdened. He, there was an emotional pain on him. This was the state of the disciples. The Bible says a lot, you know, about, about when someone has a broken heart, a crushed spirit, and what that looks like. You know, Proverbs 18, verse 14. Do you have that? Proverbs 18, verse 14. It says, The spirit of a strong man sustains him in bodily pain or trouble. But a weak and broken spirit, who can raise up or bear that? Who can raise up or bear a broken and distressed spirit? You know, when you, when you have a broken heart, and when you've been, when something has hit your inner world, I mean, just, there's so many things that have, you, you, you have, there's a lack of motivation. You lose appetite, you fatigue, you're tired. Many times this leads into depression for many people. But you are the disciples, they are dealing with a disappointment, a brokenness, a sadness. And this is the state. But it's interesting how Jesus 
Maybe come play for me. How Jesus, in all of this, Jesus, he understands that all the disciples are broken. They, they are sad. Going right back to Cleopas and his and he's disciple friend. We see that the two of them are walking and, and Jesus walks with them in that broken state. He visits them in that broken state because he understood yeah this might be a broken season now all the events that's taken place over the last few days and even you journeying with me over the last three years we've reached a a culmination of me being here on the earth with you all this sadness all this brokenness Jesus knew he was coming to disciples that would possibly not even see him and respond to him because the world was dead on the inside. And this is what happens to many people when they go through seasons of distress, of brokenness, of disappointment, rejection. Things have gone wrong. Loss in the family. People who have walked away from them. Career disappointments. Friends. Family public coming up against you whatever it might be when you go through seasons like this you become numb and you cannot even perceive what God is saying to you and what God is wanting to do in your life but it's interesting how Jesus comes in the midst of all of that even in the midst of the doubt today we we preach a lot you you need to have faith and your doubt kind of pushes away God this kind of the narrative and the picture we paint but Jesus comes to those disciples right there with that, in that resurrected form, the Bible says he walks straight through the walls. He comes before the disciples, knowing that they doubtful, anxious, disappointed. The, this man is gone. If the people, if the Romans and the chief priests find us, they're going to accuse us of being one of his followers and they might even kill us. There was no passion to continue what took place here. These men were really disappointed and down. Jesus knew he was coming to these, to to his disciples in this state. Thomas, doubtful. Thomas, not even believing that this is Jesus. Jesus said, Thomas, come feel. See the wounds in my hands. And it shows us that God will sometimes come in the midst of brokenness. That God will journey with you even in a broken state. When people look at you and, and look at you as someone that has failed, someone that has no faith, someone that looks abandoned, God is journeying with you. In brokenness, God walks with you. God is close to those who are, the, those who are broken. He will walk with you. But he knew he was coming. He was coming with purpose because... He was revealing himself with purpose. Because the whole, his whole assignment was preparing them for this great outpouring that was about to come. It was the same disappointed group of disciples and people who experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. And was raised up as a powerhouse supernatural church. But we see something very interesting. A Cleopas, the Bible says he was, their faces were downcast. They were clearly disappointed. They told Jesus, don't you know what's happening, man? Are you the only one here in this country that doesn't know? What's, it's the news. It's all over the news. It's all over Facebook. It's all over, it's all over Instagram, it's all over TikTok, it's all over um, ENC, it's all over, it's all over. Are you not seeing all the stuff that has happened? And Jesus journeys with them and he begins to open up the scriptures and he begins to reveal and show them, shows them, hey, this man you're talking about, let me show you who he truly is. Let me show you what his purpose really looks like. And Jesus begins to unpack himself to them. And what we see is between their broken heart and their broken state. 
and them experiencing that burning heart in the end. Between the broken heart and the burning heart, we see this encounter with the resurrection, the resurrected Son of God. God has a way of taking someone from a broken heart to a burning heart. And He does that by revealing Himself to them. And my prayer to you, my prayer for you today is that you will experience Jesus. And that you will experience the revelation of Jesus. That your, that your knowledge of Jesus will not only be theoretical, but that you will experience the presence and the power of God in your life. They, they journeyed with Jesus, did not know it was Him. He's explaining all this theory to him, to them. And at the end, the Bible says he breaks the bread. He gives it to them. Their eyes open and they realize they saw Jesus. But listen to this. They said while they were walking with him, the Bible said that they said to one another, were our hearts not burning within us? While he was talking to us, telling us about the scriptures, something was happening on the inside of them they could feel it yet they said nothing about it they could feel it yet they were not affirming or even seeing that this was Jesus himself and this is what the journey looks like sometimes when you journey out of a difficult season a difficult place you can get a little bit of a sense you feel the burning air you feel the freedom you feel that is God saying to you that is God revealing himself to you that is the promise of God breaking you free and God wanting to give you a fullness of joy and a fullness of peace and bringing you into complete freedom he wants to he wants to give you a burning heart you know it's the burn it's a burning it's the burning fire of the Holy Ghost that will burn the pain away, burn the shame away, that will burn the difficulty away. Did our hearts not burn within us as we were walking with Him? One encounter with Jesus can turn a broken heart into a burning heart. Can turn a disappointed people like those disciples in that day and make them vibrant, supernatural carriers of the kingdom of God. There's no amount of brokenness that God cannot touch, cannot heal, and turn into a burning heart. I remember when God touched my heart. He took my brokenness. And He put His fire on the inside of me. And that fire became my joy. His presence knowing that he is alive and well inside of me it became my assurance God set me free he did a great work today I believe that God wants to turn broken hearts into burning hearts he wants to turn the confusion he wants to give you freedom he wants to give you assurance I said all of those stuff early on just to get you to this point that that entire that entire story that was playing out with the disciples was a story that they knew in part they did not see and know the whole story today some of you will not know the whole story you will not know the whole story of your life of your future you will not know the whole story even of your pain the difficult seasons some of the things that you might be going through you might not know the whole story and we don't know the whole story because you living out your story. Don't let your season today make you feel as if 
everything is falling apart or there's nothing working out for you don't let one season define the rest of your life the disciples could have allowed one season to define the rest of their lives but Jesus comes and he shakes their world and he rattles them he reveals himself to them may Jesus reveal himself to you for the resurrection life and power I pray that God will intervene step in and shake your world come and sing with me right now. change your heart change your heart change your life hey God will turn broken hearts into burning hearts and we're going to see that. We'll see so much more. So many more people who will have Jesus. You know what I like? The Bible said that Jesus just, he just snuck behind them. He just snuck behind them and, and started journeying with them. There are some people today who are in difficult places and, and what they don't know is that, is that Jesus is just, just slipping into their life. Some of the changes you experience won't just be like you know like a fine story man it was like this one day and boom everything changed and i was jesus just snuck into their world and started walking with them and he walked to them in the brokenness he walked to them in the confusion and he was he was revealing himself bringing understanding and lighting the fire of faith and hope on the inside of them Jesus sneak and slip into the lives of so many more people in our generation. May he slip into your life and may you experience once again the reviving, burning fire of the Holy Ghost in your life. I don't even say, Lord, give me a burning heart. Give me a burning heart for my generation. Give me a burning heart. Set me on fire. It was the scriptures. It was Jesus talking to them that caused their hearts to burn. And you know, I've preached along, I've preached this message many times, this message, and I've preached it, I've preached it in a different way. Today I came from a whole different position today. Trying to show you the broken state of these people. And now today we know so much more than they and they were I, I, I give I give Peter the right to want to go fishing man. Say, hey, I tired and I'm tired of this. I'm even felt tired. Like hey, man, I'm tired of this. I'm, I'm tired of this. I can't still go on, man. I'm tired of this. I, I can't, you know. I, I've been with Jesus for three years. I, I, I gave him my life. I cut the man's ear off for him. I did a lot for him. I left my family, I left my home, everything. I left my business for him, everything to follow him. Ever felt like that? There are people who feel like that in church. <laughs> there are people like that who feel like that in church. I've given everything. I've given everything. And they get to certain breaking points in their lives. But they feel like, yeah, I've given everything. I don't, I'm tired. But every time you feel like that, no, God won't leave you like that. He will step back into your world and he'll say, I will revive your heart again. I will blow and breathe life into you again. Because this is what the resurrection is all about. The resurrection takes a broken thing and revives it. The resurrection is all about God taking a broken thing, a dead thing, and giving it life again. And this morning, I want you to continue in this, in this in this this flow this thread this space of God will give me life again God will revive your heart again he will revive your passion again he will revive your fire again he will revive your prayer life again whatever has died some of you have journeyed into many other things you have done many other things and that's okay and that's good but God God is saying I will revive your heart again 
the distance I will bring you closer again and I will cause my fire to burn in your heart and you will represent me in your hour you will represent me in your day you will burn for me and Peter was burning for him days after that uh, Peter began to in fact a month 50 days after that Jesus began at least a hundred days about three months after that Jesus began to Jesus revealed himself poured out his spirit and Peter begins to preach the gospel is preached with power and the gospel is spread throughout Jerusalem and it goes through the nations of the earth today we are standing here because someone caught a burning heart because someone's life was lit on fire because a burning heart God there was someone who possessed the burning heart when the Lord gave you a burning heart Spirit of God, I pray this morning. Let the hearts of your people burn for you. Let them hunger for you. Let them thirst for you. I pray for a holy supernatural desperation on the inside of them. In the mighty name of Jesus. And today, God, we pray may every empty place, broken place, hard place, stronghold, everything that's been tied up in their world, tied up in their heart and mind. Today we break it off them in Jesus' name. We cancel it off their lives. And I pray for the wind of God to blow and for the wind of God to cause the fires of your spirit, the fires of revival, to burn within their hearts, I pray. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And we give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. Yes, Holy Spirit, right now. Even in this moment right now, won't you go and just receive right now. Receive. Receive. Receive.